first lesson for this Good Shepherd Sunday, for Sunday after Easter, is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 13, beginning at verse 15. After the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of, of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson is taken from the book of Revelation, John's vision that God had given him of, of a little brief glimpse of heaven. Chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise, and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor, and power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of our Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 22. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him, saying, The Jews were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace are yours. From God our Heavenly Father, through His Son and our Savior Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the victorious Lamb, whom we focus on again on a, a Good Shepherd Sunday in the church year. Our text for this evening, this morning, excuse me, is Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Sometimes depicted in our communion liturgies, most often depicted in people when they're taking a look at, now what is heaven going to be like? What can we expect when we get to heaven? And here God gives John a, 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 a good vision and remember, this is a dream, and that's why you have things like creatures and the elders and the beasts that we have reference to here. It, it's a dream with lots of symbolic action, but it really does give us a good idea of what we can expect to see in heaven someday. 
dear brothers and dear sisters in our Lord and our Savior, our Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. If you've ever had an opportunity to watch <clears throat> a championship game, championship match, whatever it is on any level, whether that's grade school or high school or college or, or in the pros, professionals, it's always fun to watch when a team wins a championship. Again, it doesn't matter on what level it is because the enthusiasm, the exuberance is, is basically the same on every single level. You watch as the clock slowly counts down, second by second, all the way down to zero. You hear the buzzer from the scoreboard, and then what happens? The teams flood the field. <clears throat> the coaches flood the field. The fans, if they have not been held back by police or security forces, they flood the field to join in the celebration of the fans. Sometimes there's confetti coming down, especially if the home team is the one that won the championship game. Players are running around, they're jumping around, they're high-fiving, they're, they're hugging each other. They usually end up in a big pile in the middle of the court on top of one another. It's a celebration. Fast forward a couple of minutes, and then there's the presentation of the trophy. And you've got the league president, or whoever it is, who has this trophy and presents it to the coach, usually, of the winning team. Then the coach takes it over to the team, and every single one of the members of that team try to get a, either a finger or a hand on that trophy as it is hoisted high in the air for everybody to see and the photographers to shoot. That's what victory looks like on a sports field or on a court at the end of an athletic contest. What we have here in our text for this morning is what victory looks like in the church. A little bit different. We don't have a big scoreboard in the middle. We don't have a, a, a clock counting down to zero so that the benediction is done at amen, the last amen when we sing it and we're done. We don't have a focus on the, the teams in the middle of the field. Our focus is where? Usually our focus is drawn to the front, to the altar, to the cross, especially on the altar, whether it's a crucifix with Jesus' body on the cross or without the body of Jesus on the cross. Whatever the case, we're drawn to that cross. We don't have players that are dressed in certain colors. We don't have cheerleaders leading the action and the cheers, motivating the players to do better. We don't have fans, rabid fans in bleachers surrounding the stadium with, with the paint, painted faces with their favorite team's colors. We don't have any of that. So what does victory look like in the church? <clears throat> the book of Revelation tells us, or at least it gives us a taste of what victory looks like in the church. John, St. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was privileged by Jesus enough to have been given a dream in the later stages of his life. John is getting to be an old man. He outlived the rest of his disciples, who most of them were, were executed because of their faith. But John was privileged to receive this vision of what heaven was going to be look like and the victory of the Lamb in heaven. And, and so John is, is writing down what God gave him as his dream of what it's going to be look like in heaven. And, and with this dream, boy, we can sure look forward to something beyond this life, can't we? This life, you, you might be happy in this life, you might joy in this life, you might take great joy in the things that happen in this life, but it does not compare to what we can look forward to in the next life, right? John paints the picture by starting off this way. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude of people that no one could count. If you've ever been to Miller Park on a packed house day about 42,000 people give or take if you go up to Lambeau Field you've got probably double that I would guess on a packed house day which is basically every Green Bay Packer game home game I don't know what the biggest stadium in the world is but I would guess that Indianapolis Motor Speedway has anybody been down there as I checked 250,000 people can sit in the grandstands and in the infield 
for any given race, Indianapolis 500. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to see or to experience at any one time in a person's life. But yet John says, this is what I saw. I saw a vast multitude of people that I could not even begin to count in this room. Not only them, but he could see what? He could see the people that were in the Old Testament, the people that we learned about in our Sunday school lessons once upon a time. In the New Testament talking about the apostles we're talking about the apostle paul we're talking about all the people of the early church that the holy spirit worked faith in their hearts and brought them into the church since this was a vision of the future who else was john seeing he was seeing all the people that are out back in the cemetery behind this church all those who have died in the faith who are now celebrating around the throne of the lamb Since he could see in the future, he could also see who? You and me someday. Because the Holy Spirit has worked faith in our hearts as well. God does it through holy baptism. And John sees you and my and my faces in that huge group of people that he could not even possibly count. And it's not just a bunch of of white people who originated from northern Europe eventually or once upon a time. It's people of every language, people of every race, of every tribe, of every nation, which should remind us of something when we're putting our contributions into the offering plate because part of that dollar goes to what? Missionaries, so that there are more people of every tribe and nation and color and race. That, that's a good reminder that Jesus died not just for us, who look like us, who act like us, who are like us, but people of all nations and countries, not just a select few. Then John gets a little bit more specific. Who are these people? He says, these are people who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people, these are they, who have come out of the great tribulation. The word tribulation is kind of an interesting one in the Greek because it really talks about something that is kind of pressed in on different sides. So if you imagine yourself in a room and all of a sudden the walls of the room start getting smaller somehow. And so you're pressed in from this side and then you're pressed in from this side and then you're pressed in from the south and then the north and you're almost like you're a cornered animal. What's the point of the word? People who are suffering. Because isn't that what the world is like in our lives? There are things in this world that press us in on every side. And and, and we've gone through the same challenges weekly. It could be a financial pressing in on every side. It could be a health challenge that you are being pressed in from a different side it could be a problem with one of your children that's pressing you in on another side it could be some kind of a relationship problem that's pressing you in from every side whatever it is loneliness death that's what happens in this world because we have all kinds of consequences of sin to deal with in this life. And sometimes doesn't it feel like you just want to throw up the white flag and say, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to deal with this any longer. Lord, take me now. I'm, I'm, I'm cornered. I'm being crushed and pressed in from every side. John goes on with the description. These are people who have come out of the great tribulation. No longer are they pressed in from every side and every angle. These people who have been washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. You, You know, there's only one cure for being pressed in from every side, isn't there? And that's the same cure that is the cure for all of our problems. The really, really important ones and the not so important ones that kind of hit us on a daily basis. No matter what presses us in, no matter what makes us want to throw in the flag, in the white flag, whether if it's our own doing, because sometimes we bring our problems on ourselves, don't we? And, and, and we have to admit that. Or if it's just the consequences of sin out there. There's a cure and there's a one solution. The blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our guilt, our despair, our fear is gone. This is 
the Lamb of God that John the Baptist talked about earlier in Jesus' ministry. There's the Lamb of God. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to take away the sins of the world. By his blood, you are going to be washed clean from all of that guilt and from all of your sins. Where there was no joy, he replaces it with joy. Where there was no peace, he replaces it with peace. Through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, our problems, our tribulations are gone. John goes on. He says, not only do you see things in heaven, or not only did he see things in heaven, but he also said there's sounds in heaven. And these are the shouts of the people that were surrounding the Lamb of God on the throne. What were they saying? They were yelling out this, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the angels were also joining in, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, Amen. It would be nice to bring some of those kinds of shouts and yells and songs of praise to our worship services on any given Sunday, wouldn't it? To hear a little bit, a little piece of what goes on in heaven, wouldn't it be nice to hear that in our worship services? It wouldn't be nice. We do. Every single Sunday, every time we gather together in God's house, we sing it in the portions of the liturgy. We sing it in the hymns that we sing. The world needs to hear those kinds of songs sung by believers like you and me. We need to hear about what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We just sang that hymn about five weeks ago before Easter, leading up to Good Friday. The world needs to hear about the fact that we can lay our sins on Jesus, who is the spotless Lamb of God who takes all of our sins and frees us from the accursed load of sin and guilt that is on us. We need to hear that Jesus Christ is risen today and that since I know that my Redeemer lives, as the sign says out there, I also will live someday. We need to hear that Jesus is the good shepherd of the sheep and that he is continuing to lead and feed and guard and guide and protect us all. We need to hear how we can know Jesus' voice and thereby follow him that much closer. If there is anything that deserves our praise, if there is anything that deserves our shouts, uh, uh, that, that, that John talks about in Revelation. It's what God has done for us. When somebody has done something for you, 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 you want to share that. What God has done for us in our salvation, that's worth shouting about. We have got guilt taken away and sins forgiven and Easter peace and joy forever. Join our voices, and we join our voices with those ones in heaven already because the Lamb of God has won the victory. And because Jesus has won the victory on Easter, uh, that lasting victory, there, there's one final part to that celebration. Be, before I mention that at the end of every victory celebration kind of comes this, and that's the trophy presentation. And again, you, you've, you've seen it in, on TV. Maybe you've seen it in person sometimes. The trophy is presented to the coach. The coach then takes it to the players. The players hoist that trophy high up in the air. And then what happens to that trophy? If you're Rob Gronkowski, did you hear what happened to the NFL championship trophy? He was playing baseball with it, and he was hitting it, and it dented, big dent in the Lombardi trophy. Most trophies, however, go in a case, and they get dusty, and they get forgotten about. When somebody wants to build a new case, then those trophies might go in a back room and get forgotten about, or they might go away entirely, which just tells us that fame in this world is very fleeting, and it does not last forever. And that the things that we can celebrate in this world, you know what, celebrate it nice. That's, that's wonderful. But don't put your eternal celebration into that kind of celebration. As the Bible tells us, where moths get to it and rust destroys and things that the elements of this world kind of work on things and finally make them fade away to nothingness, 
That's different for our celebration. That's different for our victory. What do we receive on the day that we receive that victory, the Lamb? A crown of life that can never perish or spoil or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you forever. Why? Because Jesus' victory over death is our victory over death. And because Jesus' victory over sin is our victory over sin. And Jesus' victory over Satan and the devil is our victory 100% over sin and death and the devil. And that's what John talks about in the last couple of verses of our text. He says, this is what you can look forward to in heaven someday. These are very familiar verses, but I'll read them again. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Picture the last person that you have put in the ground in those verses. Picture the last loved one who has died in the faith with those words. There's nothing that can give you a better or a more lasting comfort than what Jesus tells us is going to be the lot or the future of those people in heaven someday. No more pains, no more thirst, no more hunger, no more heat scorching down on us, no more tribulations pressing on us on, on every way thinking that, that, that we're going to die someday. Because that's all done because we have the victory of the Lamb. The victor that victorious Lamb then becomes our good shepherd. And, and from the, this day until the day that he calls us home, he says, I'm going to continue to be your shepherd. And you can look forward to the day when you will worship me at the center of the throne someday. All because you have Jesus as your shepherd. If you have the Lord as your shepherd, you don't have anything to be afraid of. If you have the Lord as your shepherd, you don't have to be in want for anything. If you have the Lord as your shepherd, you have peace and security and safety, even when you're walking through that valley of the shadow of death. If you have the Lord as your shepherd, you have an eternal home in heaven. That's a sight to behold, because the victory of the Lamb is our victory as Christians. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.